Okay. So our goal today, um, and when we're, this is chapter two from the textbook, our goal is to basically talk about the, the, the four things from chemistry you need to know in order to be able to understand what's going on in cell biology. And there are only four that you need to know for this course. There are many others that you need to know for other courses, but there are four for this course. The first one um, is, is this question here. Why are there certain elements that are important to life? Life doesn't function without them, but there's so very little of it inside of living organisms. Because we'll go through and we'll talk about the most abundant elements that you find in living organisms, but some of the most important elements, there's so very little of it inside of living organisms. Well, why are they so important? The next question is this one. Uh, why do elements behave the way that they do? How do we predict what they're going to do? And, and what type of chemistry do they actually participate in? The third one is, why is water essential to life? And it's, it's really specifically, why is liquid water necessary for life? Uh, and then the last one is, is what's, why do we find acidic conditions in, in various living organisms? What's, what's with acids and bases? Why does something behave as an acid? And, and how does that actually play a role in living organisms? All right? So the way I will tend to organize this, this is really no different uh, than most of the classes I've done. I think most of you I recognize uh, where the lectures are framed around questions. If you hate that, I'm sorry. I feel like it's helpful. It's helpful for me, and, and I really do feel like it's helpful for you. Sometimes it gets a little annoying. We're like, man, he kind of forced that question. But So why are certain elements important for life, even if there's so very little of it? And so, basically, to answer that question very simply is um, we call these things trace elements, the elements that there's very, very little of them in living organisms, but they are necessary for life. And the reason they're necessary for life is because they're, they're essential for carrying out specific reactions. Okay? So there may be a reaction that doesn't happen very often in your body, but if it doesn't happen, you die. And you need a certain chemical or a certain element to make that happen. And so we call these the trace elements. And so um, we'll talk about what those are in just a minute. But some of them are involved in regulating metabolism, uh, regulate, which basically means regulating all of the chemical reactions that take place in your body. And then some of them act as physiological controls. So they're on and off switches. <clears throat> Now, most of the weight of an organism is composed of only four elements, and in this order. Oxygen is by far the most abundant element in living organisms by mass. Carbon is next. Hydrogen is third. And nitrogen is fourth. And so the reason why is basically every biomolecule in your body, and we'll see what that means on Friday, is made up of these four uh, elements. And then water, of course, is, is oxygen and hydrogen. The reason why hydrogen isn't higher on this list is why. You want to know why hydrogen isn't higher on this list? I'll tell you, it's not because there are fewer hydrogen atoms. It's super tiny. So tiny, and it's so light. 16 hydrogen atoms have the same mass as one oxygen atom. Okay? So it's super tiny. And it, yeah, it's not because it's not super abundant, it's just it's really small. So then there are seven more elements that make up about 4% of the weight of our bodies. And again, these ratios vary a great deal depending on how much adipose tissue you have, which is a fancy way of saying fat. The more fat you have, the more water you have, and so then, then oxygen and hydrogen make up a larger percentage uh, than if your body percent body fat is lower. So in this order, so after these four, in this order, the seven uh, next most abundant are uh, phosphorus, and uh, it actually probably is not in this order. I grouped it because of their function. So part of biomolecules, maybe it is in this order. We'll see that there's a chart in a minute. So phosphorus and sulfur um, function in a lot of biomolecules. Again, we'll see this on Friday when we talk about biomolecules. Uh, calcium, potassium, and sodium, and 
to a lesser extent, chlorine and magnesium regulate a lot of physiological processes. <clears throat> Those of you that have taken a physiology or an anatomy class before and have talked about action potential, where you get cells will actually communicate, a lot of that is governed by these, uh, these other elements. Yeah, so it's not in that order because potassium is actually above sulfur. So it's grouped based on their function. <clears throat> Sorry if you can't tell, I'm recovering from a sickness. I don't always sound like this. I usually sound much, much worse. So. <laughs> Thanks. So this is a figure right out of your textbook, and it's helpful to just see, one, the most abundant elements in the human body, and two, how that compares with other materials. This one is particularly fascinating, I think, comparing the human body to Earth's crust. <clears throat> so oxygen, most abundant in the human body, also the most abundant in the Earth's crust. But the next three most common in the human body are not even present on the list of the Earth's crust. Which is so weird. It's like, where did it come from in the first place? It's a wonderful question. But it's basically all three of these are locked in organic material. It's basically your only source of these three elements is organic material. And... I mean, technically, there are some organisms that can get nitrogen from the atmosphere, and we can get carbon from the atmosphere by breathing in carbon dioxide, although that's not a major source for us. It is for plants and other things. But most of these, these are locked up in organic materials, and they just kind of cycle around. Right? They're in the plants. We eat the plants. Then we die, and the plants eat us. Right? And it just kind of, it just kind of cycles around. <clears throat> All right. Any questions about that? So basically what you should anticipate being asked about this is what are the most ab abundant elements in the human body and what are they doing, right? And so oxygen, it's the most abundant in the human body and what is it doing? Where do you find most of our oxygen in our bodies? In water. Okay, our body is about 70, anywhere from 60 to 75% water by mass, again, depending on how much fat you have built up, the more fat you have, the more water you have. That's why camels have those massive fatty humps, right? And then, have you ever seen a camel after it's gone like a week without drinking water? And it started hydrolyzing that fat, it, its hump is all saggy. It's pulling, anyways. Sorry, that's a, it's a different course. Um, yeah, most of this is in water, but a lot of this is also in the biomolecules that make up the living organism. Carbon. Okay, carbon's second most abundant. What's it doing? You'll see this more on Friday, but it's the backbone of every single biomolecule. If it's a protein, it's got a carbon backbone. If it's a sugar, it's got a carbon backbone. If it's a nucleic acid or some kind of an oil, it's got a carbon backbone. Okay, Tons of carbon. Uh, hydrogen, where's most of the hydrogen? In water and in other biomolecules. And then in nitrogen, it's almost extensively or exclusively in the other biomolecules. Right? Calcium, where's calcium? Not one of the four most abundant, but where do we find a lot of calcium? In bone, okay, in teeth, and then stored up in muscle cells, but we'll talk more about that later. All right, so our next question, well, what makes the elements behave in a certain way? What makes it so nice for, what makes carbon such a great element to make up the backbone of all these different types of biomolecules? And why does it behave the way it does? It's an excellent question. And so the, the simplest way to answer this question is this way. That elements tend to behave according to the number of valence electrons they have. Okay? You're like, that's awesome. I love it. What does it mean? What are valence electrons? What's that? The, outermost. the electrons in the highest energy level. You can call them the outermost electrons or the electrons in the highest energy level. But that tends to determine how an element is going to behave. Because what does every element want? It wants stability, and where they are most stable is when they have a filled outermost shell. Okay, So every atom is going to behave in such a way to make that happen. And for carbon to make that happen, it has to share electrons with four different atoms. Or it could do less than four, but then have to share multiple sets of electrons. And so now you've got carbon in order for it to get what it wants, it has to make a bunch of bonds, 
Why does that make it a great thing to make a backbone out of? Yeah, because it's basically attaching to four different things. You can put so much on it. It's wonderful. So uh, most accessible, yeah, so they are the most accessible, the easiest to separate from the nucleus. They are the outermost, that makes sense. Highest energy level. The more valence electrons an atom has in its neutral state, the harder it is to pull an electron away. Okay, so if we're looking over here, the nice thing about the periodic table is it's organized for you to predict how an element is going to behave. Okay, so everything in this column right here has one valence electron. Everything in this column here has how many? Two, and then we skip all the way over here because these are all weird and strange. <laughs> Don't do what we expect them to do. But you can build jewelry out of them and it's, you know, it's just fun. Everything here has how many? Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so the further you get to the right, the more valence electrons they have, the harder it is to pull one away. So when you only have one, everything wants, every atom wants a fully filled outer shell. Well, it's only got one. To fill it, it needs seven more. But this is really easy to pull away. If you pull one away from it, guess what? You drop down to the next lower energy level and it's full. This thing got what it wanted and something else got what it wanted. It had an electron it wanted to give away and something had an electron it wanted to take, right? It's like your kitten after it grows up. You know, it's like the kitten, it's adorable and it's cute, but then it becomes a cat and you don't want it. <laughs> but you can't just let it go because it'll come back. So you got to find somebody that'll take it. It's just like that first column there, you know? You find somebody that wants a cat because they're a collector, right? Collector of cats and other life forms. If you like cats, man, it's good for you. It's good for you. Somebody's got to. Because somebody needs to take all the cats that nobody wants after they're not kittens anymore. All right. So this I already mentioned, but we'll put it up here just to remind you. Atoms are the most stable, and that's what they want when their outer shell is full when they have eight valence electrons. Check this out. So this column, how many valence electrons do the elements in here have? Eight. eight. That's what every atom wants. So what do you think these are gonna do chemically? Not much. Nothing. Because what atoms do is behave chemically to get what they want. These already have what they want. And we talk about them like they're people. People don't know what they want. Right? You think you know what you want. Atoms know what they want, and they'll make it happen. Make it happen. All right. So here's a diagram out of the text, and it shows you the valence electrons. And so the valence, again, electrons, again, are the electrons in the highest energy level, so it's going to be on this outer ring. And so if we just focus on aluminum, how many electrons are in this outer ring? Three. Okay. But then we look over at aluminum and we're like, okay, if it's three, it better be in this column here. Looky there. There it is. Okay? So it has three. How many does it want? Eight. So it either needs to gain five or it needs to find something to take those three. And unlike cats, where it'd be super easy to find yourself five new cats, for elements, it's actually easier for them to get somebody to take those three electrons than it is to get five. Because electrons, they're not just floating around in the ether waiting to be grabbed. They're, they're whirling around other atomic nuclei. Okay. So it makes sense? Why do elements behave the way that they do? Valence electrons. Because what do they want? Or how many valence electrons do they want? They want eight. If they don't have eight, they need to figure out a way to get eight. And it's either for aluminum, it's lose three and then it'll have the eight in this next lower energy level, or it's gain five and get to here, okay? And for aluminum, it's easier for it to lose three. And we'll talk about what that means when we get into specifics, okay? But again, right now we're just, what chemistry do you need to know to be able to, to deal with what we're gonna do in cell biology? Next question, why is water essential to life? And this slide, is probably my least favorite slide from this entire semester. You're like, that says a lot, because you've already put some slides up there that were awful. The reason why this is because it's basically just a list of the wonderful things of water. And it's not that I don't like water, I love water. 
but I just I don't like having a slide where it's just a list of information. But I, I couldn't really think of a better way to do this. Okay, so here we go. Characteristic one. Oh, this is just kind of a general statement too. Um, so uh, what makes water behave the way that it does is because water is polar. And so what that means is, is that water's got a negative end and a positive end, a negative pole and a positive pole. And so what that means is that one, molecule, one water molecule can interact with a second when the positive pole of the second interacts with the negative pole of the other. And you call that a hydrogen bond. Okay, and so water makes and breaks hydrogen bonds all the time. Every polar molecule makes and breaks hydrogen bonds all the time. But water does that. You're like, wow, that's awesome. I don't know why that's so good, but this, this is cool. Um, hydrogen bonds, just in context, are one of the four bonds essential to life. And so these are the four bonds. Ionic bonds, what are these? A, mo a, be a bond between typically a metal and a non-metal. Probably better to define it as a bond between a cation and an anion. But anyways, anyways, between a metal and a non-metal, we'll take that. Okay. So an ionic bond. What about a covalent bond? Between two non-metals, typically. Again, that's not always. Sometimes you can get metals involved in this. Here they transfer the electrons. So aluminum, it found somebody to take its three cats. Okay. Now aluminum is attracted to things with lots of cats. Why? I don't know. It's like it just got rid of it, but now it's attracted. See this whole cat analogy, it broke down. <laughs> Nobody's attracted to people with lots of cats. Right? <laughs> that was harsh. I didn't mean to, wow. I didn't mean to say that. If you have a lot of cats, I'm sorry. I just, I, cats are fine. All right, so covalent, they haven't transferred electrons, they're sharing electrons. Okay, so in covalent bonds, they are sharing electrons. This is what carbon has to do to get to eight valence electrons. Because carbon's sitting right here. So how many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. What's easier, to gain four or to lose four? You're like, yes. Right? And the answer is really neither. It's very difficult for carbon to lose four. It's very difficult for carbon to gain four. Okay? So it doesn't do either. What it does is it finds partners to share electrons with. Okay? And so that's what carbon will do. Can't really find anybody to take its four cats. Can't find anybody to give it four cats, so it just shares eight cats. Right? Now, this analogy is getting worse. I love it. <laughs> then hydrogen bonds, we just mentioned those. It's where you've got a polar region of the molecule and a, a positive pole of one molecule attracted to a negative pole of another. Okay? Hydrogen bonds. And then van der Waals forces, these are very, very weak forces, but sometimes they get, you could just have a lot of them. Have you ever seen a lizard on the side of a house or on a fence? If you haven't seen that, you should, you should go somewhere and see it because it's pretty awesome. Or a lizard upside down on the ceiling. It's stuck to the wall or the ceiling entirely with these forces that are super weak. But when you have hundreds of millions of them, now it's good. right? It's like toddlers. An individual toddler is not going to beat you in an arm wrestling match. But if a hundred million of them smother you, you're in big trouble. <laughs> Gosh, what would a hundred million toddlers look like? It would be scary. <laughs> I am deathly, so there are two things that I have, uh, I am deathly afraid of. One of them is rational, one of them is irrational. My irrational fear is mice. I have an irrational fear of mice. And really when I get, when I am afraid, I get angry. So it's not like I'm going to run away from it, I just get mad. Like I don't know why, it's an irrational fear. My other thing I'm deathly afraid of are toddlers, and that is a rational fear. <laughs> Because you don't, uh, you have no idea what's going on inside their head, <laughs> right? Teenagers very predictable. They just want a sandwich, right? <laughs> so you can handle a teenager, like feed it and they're fine. Toddlers, they have no idea what they want. <sighs> Sorry, I've got several toddlers at home, but in small, in small pockets, they're they're manageable. They ask, they want me to like help out in the toddler class at church. I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I told them I have a rational, reasonable fear of toddlers. Can't do it. Because I, I told them when I get scared, I get angry. <laughs> it's not a good combination. Anyways, so van der Waals forces, I didn't even tell you what these are. I just got distracted by this stuff that doesn't even matter. So van der Waals forces are when the electrons of one atom are attracted to the nucleus of another. 
So the nucleus of an atom is positively charged. The electrons are negatively charged, right? And that's what keeps the atom together. The negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus and the electrons stay there. But if the atoms get close enough, the electrons of one atom actually become attracted to the nucleus of another atom. That's what van der Waals forces are. And so they're very weak forces. But again, when you have a lot of them, they can stick a gecko to a wall or to a ceiling. I mean, they can stick more things than a gecko. But. Um, so another, oh, this is the first wonderful thing about water. Water is less dense as a solid than it is as a liquid. And you're like, that's awesome, right? I very clearly understand that's why water is essential to life. And so what that means is ice floats. Okay, you're like, cool. But why is that essential to life? Yeah, so that things can stay alive inside of bodies of water. Okay, if, if ice was, if, if water was more dense as a solid when the water froze at the surface, which tends to be where it's coldest, then you'd have this big block of ice floating down, just smashing all of the animals into this substrate at the bottom of the body of water. <laughs> While that might be fun to watch, that's terrible for those things to stay alive, right? There's a massive sheet of ice just crushing everything underneath it. It's horrible. This is a terrible image. Why did you make me think that? Uh, water, also because water is polar, this is because water is polar, this is also because water is polar, it has a really high specific, specific heat. Highest of any material on Earth. Naturally occurring material. Liquid water. And you're like, man! That's awesome. I totally understand why that makes water essential to life. Chris. What's Chris or Christopher? Doesn't matter. Okay. I'll do Chris because that's one syllable. <laughs> what, what's specific heat? What is specific heat is the amount of heat required to raise a material one degree. So specifically, it's the amount of heat required to raise one gram of material one degree Celsius. But you could just say it's the amount of heat something can take without changing temperature. And so if water has a really high specific heat, it means water requires an enormous amount of energy to change temperature. Why is that important to life? Yeah? So it acts as a buffer? Yeah, it acts as a buffer, both in our bodies, keeping our bodies from overheating, but also globally, keeping the Earth from overheating. I don't know if you knew this or not, but there's a lot of water on Earth. I think it's like two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And then when you talk about volume, it's an enormous amount of water. And it keeps actually the global temperatures fairly steady. You're like, fairly steady? It was 35 degrees when I woke up, and it's 70 degrees now. It's not steady. It'd be a lot worse without water. The problem is there's not a lot of water here. That's, anyways, sorry. Uh, water requires a lot of energy to turn from a liquid into a gas. Okay? So in addition to requiring a lot of energy to heat up, it also requires a lot of energy to change from a liquid into a gas. Why is that important to life? Yeah. It is stable. right? So it stays liquid for a long time, for more than what other materials would. Yeah, it's good. Any other reasons why that makes water essential to life? If, it, if this weren't true, you, your, your liquid water in your body would evaporate a lot more than it does, which would be make keeping water difficult. But it also allows you to keep your body cool. So if the, the sweat on your forehead is going to evaporate, an enormous amount of energy is going to have to dump into that sweat to make it evaporate. And where'd that energy come from? From your body. And it cools you down. It's so wonderful, because not all animals evaporatively cool the way we do. Some of them can't, and so they overheat, and so they, they don't get to play sports. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think there are two more. There might be three more. And I told you this is my least favorite slide from the entire semester. So if you could get through this, it's all uphill from here. Until you get tired of listening to me talk, and then it's just it's terrible every day. You're like, Dr. Ring, I'm already there. Been here for... 45 minutes, and I can't imagine hearing you say another word. All right. Um, water molecules exposed to air, they can, there's an entire region where they can't make hydrogen bonds, right? Instead of being completely surrounded 
by water molecules, water at the surface, they're not completely surrounded by water molecules, right? They've got air on one side and water on the other. And so what that means is the total amount of hydrogen bonds that they have to make is now occurring in a smaller space. And so what it means is they make a really, really strong bond at the water surface, which allows some things to walk along that water surface, like Peter, until he got scared, right? Jesus. Do you see the Jesus Christ lizard? It's actually called a basilisk, but one of its common names is the Jesus Christ lizard because it runs along the water surface. If it gets its legs really boogieing fast enough, it'll stay because of that surface tension above the water. And it'll run away from a predator. Although, you know, there are things inside the water that want to eat it too. So sometimes you can watch a video where it's on one side of the lake and it goes to run across the other side to get away from something trying to eat it. And a fish comes and grabs it right as it's running across. It's epic. It's so wonderful. You're like, yeah, go live. Oh, man. Have you ever watched a video of a pike eating a duckling? You got to do this today. It'll change your life. Just go on YouTube and put pike eating a duckling. And there's a, there's a mama duck swimming around with like seven duck leagues behind him. And you can see this fish and it's deceptive because you can't see how big the fish is through the water. And then all of a sudden the fish comes and the duckling disappears. It's, it's pretty good. It's good stuff. Oh gosh, there were two more after this. So water molecules interact very poorly with nonpolar molecules. And this one, it told you why this one is important because this one's not as apparent as some of the others. So what this does is it actually induces membranes to form. So cell membranes, and we'll talk more about this next week, cell membranes form spontaneously in water. And it's because water does not interact with anything nonpolar because it can't make hydrogen bonds with it. And then the last thing that water being polar does to make water essential to life is it can separate atoms that are bound together with ionic bonds. So it can dissolve ionic bonds. It can dissolve salts. Why is that? Why is that important to life? Yeah, I mean, you can dissolve the salt. Some of those trace elements are only found naturally in salts like potassium and sodium and chlorine. They're really only found naturally in salts, but you don't need the salt. You need that individual element for something essential to life. And water dissolves them, which is perfect because your body has a ton of water inside of it. So you, you lick that salt lick, right? Because it's delicious, but as you're doing it, you're like, man, I'm just getting materials that are essential to life. All right, then there are a couple figures from your textbook. We're not going to talk about these too much, but it just shows you a visual representation of all of these important characteristics of water. There's surface tension, right? That spider needs to walk along the water surface. Spy you can find tons of videos of fish eating these spiders, by the way. If you don't like spiders, watching that video might encourage you after watching the duckling getting eaten by the pike. Here's water spontaneously forming a membrane. So here are these big nonpolar regions of these lipids, and the water won't interact with them. So it actually forces these, these phospholipids to double up and to separate and isolate the nonpolar materials from the water. Here's water dissolving a salt, something bound together with an ionic bond. And here's water doing that as it surrounds those. And it actually forms what's called a hydration layer. It makes it very difficult for those to reassociate while they're in water until the water evaporates. If any of you ever collected ocean water and then took it home to watch it evaporate to see how much salt was in it? If you haven't done that, you should do that. I don't know if you knew this or not, but there's, there's the ocean not very far from here. You should go there take a cup of it, bring it home, allow the water to evaporate. It'll probably take a couple of days, and then just to see how much salt is in the water. It's impressive. There's a lot of salt in there. Then you can eat the salt afterwards. <laughs> All right. Any questions about that? All right. Is this how it's going to be every day? Not a lot of questions. It's just like, let's just get through it. Power through. Okay. I'll have to get more creative. 
I'll get more creative. All right, last question. Question number four. What's with acids and bases? So what is an acid, what is a base, and why are they essential to life? Now there are a lot of ways to define acids and bases. I will give you one that I think is the simplest. And so an acid is anything that's going to release hydrogen ions into the solution. Now there are some acids that don't do this, but for our purposes, we're gonna say an acid is anything that's gonna release hydrogen into the solution. And a base is anything that's either going to release hydroxide ions or it's gonna cause water to release hydroxide ions into the solution. Do you like, this is awesome. Not only do I know what an acid and a base is, but I know exactly why they're essential to life. If you do from that, that's impressive. It is impressive. So there's <clears throat> one more thing we need to talk about just generally about acids and bases, and then we'll apply it to living forms. So we can measure the strength of an acid using what's called the pH scale. And so it is a logarithmic scale similar to the Richter scale that measures earthquakes, right? Are you familiar with earthquakes? I don't know if you know this or not, but there are lots of earthquakes in California. We haven't had a big one in a while. But anyways, they say we're due. I know. But it's a logarithmic scale as well. So if you go from a, a magnitude 5 earthquake to a magnitude 6 earthquake, the magnitude 6 earthquake is 10 times as strong as the magnitude 5. And it's because it's a logarithmic scale. Which means the same is true for pH. So pH, the lower the pH, the more acidic it is. And if you have a pH of zero versus a pH of one, the pH of zero is 10 times as acidic as something with a pH of one. Okay, make sense? So that's like impressive. If you're like, okay, my stomach can handle something with a pH of one. And you take something with a pH of two, you're like, that's pretty close to one. It might, it might disrupt some things. But no, two isn't close to one at all. It's 10 times weaker than something with a pH of one. Okay, that make sense? Yeah. This is why it matters. And this is what makes it important uh, to living forms, is we interact with things that are acidic and basic all the time, both of which are very dangerous. Something that's acidic is dangerous, something that's basic is dangerous, and so we have buffer systems in our bodies that are made up of weak acids and weak bases that will buffer against this. And so if you swallow something that's acidic, you have a buffer system in your stomach that will take on those hydrogen ions being released by that really acidic material. And it'll shift over to account for and to take on those extra hydrogen ions. So like if you drank battery acid, like why am I gonna drink battery acid? I don't know. But if you drank something that's not quite as acidic but still pretty acidic like lemon juice, you made yourself some ceviche, right? <laughs> Cooking the fish in lemon juice, okay? Well you consume all of that acid, the stomach, your buffer system in your stomach fluid will actually take on those extra hydrogen ions and it'll buffer against that. And so that your stomach acid doesn't get too acidic. Although it's got to be acidic to break stuff down. But anyways, it doesn't get too acidic. Or if you drink something really basic, like Drano. Like, why would I drink Drano? I don't know. Something not as basic. I don't even know. I mean, milk is basic, but it's not very basic at all. Here, let's just look at this. Rather than just trying to come up with hair remover, oven cleaner, <laughs> sodium hydroxide. Yeah, I don't, I don't see... Like, man, you know what I could really do? I could get rid of these, the hair lining my esophagus. There's no hair lining your esophagus. Don't drink hair remover. Milk of magnesia, that's pretty good when you're getting that heartburn, right? You take that milk of magnesia. But if you just drank it because it's delicious and you love the taste, ooh, ooh, what's this, a Pepto-Bismol. That's another good one. Pepto-Bismol is pretty basic. And it is delicious, right? <laughs> like, I don't know what it is about Pepto-Bismol because the color is just awful, but I can't stop drinking it. 
the buffer system in your stomach, it'll take on all those extra hydroxide ions that are showing up from something, a base being there and will actually shift it around to buffer against that with having a weak acid and a weak base. And here's basically how it works. So we've got this buffer system that will keep the pH roughly in the middle. So if you shift the pH over to the acidic side, which would come down here, the buffer system, those, those weak bases in those buffer system, they'll take on some of those extra hydrogen ions and shift it back to the middle. And if you shift it over to the basic side, the weak acid will take on the extra hydroxide ions and will send it back to the middle. So you maintain a very narrow pH range. Okay, that's why it's important to life. And what we'll see on Friday, but then especially in a few weeks, proteins have a very specific pH range at which they function. Do you know why you can cook fish in acid? Yeah, you're doing basically the same thing that heat does, of breaking down the proteins. But you're using pH, an acid, instead of heat to do it. The only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't kill the parasites in the fish. It's like cooking it would, cooking it with acid won't. But you're like, it's no big deal. I'll use marine fish and then the likelihood that that parasite can infect me is low, unless it's anisakis. But I'm not going to worry about that because that's only in like rock cod and everything else I want to eat. <laughs> Basically, it boils down to this. Check your fish for worms if you're going to use it to make ceviche. If you're just going to cook it, oh, just take like a, like, a, like, a, like a piece of glass and push it down a little bit, the fish, and then just look through the tissue and you, you'll see a worm. If you go looking for it and it's there, you'll find it. And then if it's there, just take some tweezers, get in there, pull that worm right out, throw it in the trash, cook your fish, you know? But if you're going to cook it with heat, don't even worry about the parasite. <laughs> Have a wonderful day.